So uh, the next speaker is going to be Dr. Jacob uh, Labus. Um, he's a staff cardiovascular anesthesiologist at the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care in Cologne, uh, Germany. He's a member of the German Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. Um, he, he's actually part of the German Cardiac Anesthesia Scientific work, Working Group um, and the EACT IEC, and he's part of the subcommittee of uh, echocardiography at the EACT IEC. Um, his clinical and scientific focus is uh, perioperative echo, and in particular, he's uh, mostly interested in myocardial function imaging, diastolic function, and uh, perioperative changes. So, with no further delay, please, uh, Dr. Labus, go ahead and uh, um, give us uh, an, an introduction on quantifying RV function and if the strain is the answer. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, and see, do you see my full slides? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, yes, great. Thanks. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody, um, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, First of all, I would like to thank the Eisen Committee for inviting me to put Toronto Period of Echo Symposium 2024. And it's my pleasure to talk today about quantifying right wing function and to reply to the question, is strain the answer? And I have no disclosures to declare. Um, and my presentation will uh, contain the concept of right vertical strain analysis, and I will give a short review on right vertical structure and fiber motion, since this is enormously important to understand in order to interpret and perform right vertical strain. And I will briefly discuss how right vertical function is commonly assessed, and finally, I try to answer the question if strain is helpful in clinical decision making. Since my time is limited to 20 minutes, um, I will focus on right ventricular systolic function, and I need to go ahead and start with the right ventricular structure and fiber motion. The right ventricle has a complex form. It seems triangular from the lateral view and crescent-shaped in the cross-sectional view. Appearing smaller than the left one, the right ventricle indeed has a larger volume. And it can be subdivided into three parts. The inflow tract, the trabeculated apical portion, and the outflow tract. And the right ventricle free wall is connected to the intraventricular septum via the basal loop, which passes into the thin circumferential outer fiber layer of the right ventricle free wall. While the larger portion of the right ventricle free wall consists of longitudinal myocardial fibers. Therefore, the right ventricle free wall is composed of two parts, both being connected to the intraventricular septum. The inner longitudinal fibers, representing the most of the right ventricle free wall, and the outer circumferential or oblique fibers, whatever you call it, there's no clear definition for it, being the smaller portion of the right ventricle free wall. In this context, the intraventricular septum is of special interest. Being part of the left ventricle, it is connected to the right ventricle, and it makes a major contribution to the right ventricular function. So, Structure determinates function. This is also true for the right ventricle contractile pattern. And the contraction of the right ventricle consists of three components. First, it's the contraction of the left ventricle and the intraventricular septum with the bulging of the septum into the right ventricle cavity, which is followed by a bellow-like movement of the right ventricle free wall and the longitudinal contraction leading to a shortening of the longitudinal axis. And this can be seen in the short axis view in this MRI sequence showing the bulging of the, of the myocardium uh, of the right ventricle into the uh, uh, right ventricle cavity. So, what you can see in this longitudinal sequence, the shortening of the longitudinal right ventricle axis, as well as again the bulging of the intraventricular septum into the right ventricle cavity, and the intraventricular septum acts like an abutment to the right ventricle free wall's motion. And because it has not been too complicated so far, the typical contraction of the right ventricle is a sequence starting with the inflow tract, proceeding with the apical portion, and ending with the contraction of the outflow tract of the outflow tract uh, with a delay of about 25 to 50 milliseconds. So, right ventricle contraction seems to be a complex sequence 
and how this is assessed by conventional echocardiography. And there are guidelines from both sides of the Atlantic, um, including different measurements of right ventricular dimensions and movement of the right ventricle um, by different echocardiographic techniques being used. But these guidelines now only normal and abnormal values. So it's only good or bad. But this might be correct from a cardiological perspective using transthoracic echocardiography in awake and spontaneous breathing patients in steady state conditions with no surgical procedure. But this is not the conditions of our patients. I think that all of us are faced with a different setting every day during echocardiography. There are effects of general anesthesia, positive pressure ventilation, and change of loading conditions, um, and different periprosal aspects all having influence on right ventricular function. Therefore, I was very happy to read the period of ECHO guidelines on 2020, and looking at its table regarding right ventricular function, I was excited because most of the parameters had something to do with myocardial deformation and strain. But on a closer look, recommendations were adopted from Lung and Collaborates, so it's again good or bad and validated for awake and spontaneous within patients. Hmm. So what to do? We have to look into the literature by our own. And I want to just briefly discuss these parameters because I'm sure you all know them very well, just to remind you of the advantages and shortcomings of the, uh, these parameters. And I'm starting with the right ventricular dimensions, which are easy to obtain, they are simple and fast, and there's a large amount of data, but they may underestimate the true right ventricle size because of the complex geometry of the right ventricle, and they are just static measurements. The next parameter, the TAPSI, perhaps the most often used parameter one, um, which is also easy to obtain, it's fast, um, and it is a regional longitudinal function assessment tool, and it's angle dependent, so if you want to use trans echocardiographic echocardiographic assessment, then you need the anatomic M mode or an alternative view, but TAPSI an established predictive value, but it may not adequate, be, be not adequate after cardiac surgery, and I'm sure you all know the data is more than 15 years old. After cardiac surgery, there's a reduction of TAPSI, but 3D right ventricular action fraction is often preserved. Therefore, TAPSI has already been labeled as a red herring after cardiac surgery. But is it true? Hard to say, and I will come back to this later. The next parameter is the obvious prime. Um, it's a Doppler mode. It's very similar to TAPSI, but Perhaps because it's a Doppler mode, it's even more angle dependent, and there's far less data, so I skip this parameter and go directly to right ventricle myocardial performance index, which is, from my perspective, a very interesting parameter, uh, evaluating the systolic and diastolic um, right ventricle function independent of geometric assumptions. Uh, but it's dependent on heart rate, and it's not valid in elevated right arterial pressures. But the main issue with this parameter is that there's a high inter and intra variability, observer variability in anesthetized and ventilated patients. And this was shown by Manfred Seberger's group from Basel. The median variability of this parameter in anesthetized and ventilated patients was about fourfold as high as in awake in spontaneous breathing patients. Therefore, the outers questions the use of this parameter in this setting. Another very interesting, very common, and from my point of view, um, very useful parameter in the periodic setting, it's the fraction area change. It's also easy to obtain and it includes all components of right ventricle contraction. Moreover, there's a good correlation between trans and trans assessment, and it has a predictive value in cardiac surgery. But it neglects anterior and inferior walls as well as the infundibulum. And remember, the right ventricle is more than just the right ventricle inflow tract and the apex. And we know that including cross-sectional views improves the evaluation of right ventricular function. And therefore, 3D right ventricular action fraction might be a more sufficient parameter for the period of the assessment of right ventricular function, which um, includes all components of right ventricular contraction or parts of the right ventricle and correlates well with cardiac MRI. Moreover, there's a good correlation between trans and uh, trans oesophile assessment. Therefore, this parameter is already often used as the reference method 
but it requires dedicated equipment and software. Therefore, often it's an offline analysis because the software is not regularly implemented on the echo machines, at least in our department and in many uh, German heart centers. But the main point is that the predictive value of three-dimensional right ventricular infraction has not yet been established perioperatively. And how the assessment of right ventricular function is done in clinical practice. And I admit it's a survey that's more than five years old, but I think more or less it still reflects clinical practice. And what has been done? Um, a survey was sent to academic and non-academic um, heart centers, echocardiographers, um, asking them how they assess right ventricular function. And 70 to 80 percent answered by eyeballing and tapsy. And all the other parameters were just a few percent. This might have changed in the last years because the availability of 3D echo increased, but I think still or less, uh, more or less, it still reflects current practice. And now, how can right ventricular strain add to the existing echocardiographic assessment tools? But first arises the question, what is strain? Strain is a dimensional measurement describing a deformation of a structure, typically lengthening or shortening between two time points, for example, end systole and, and diastole. And this deformation is expressed in percent of the initial length. Currently, strain analysis is based on speckle tracking echocardiography. But what is speckle tracking? Speckles are these dark and bright pixels in a usually 2 dB mode view. They're just acoustic reflections, and their relation to each other is like a fingerprint of the myocardium. And speckles can be tracked in blocks through the entire cardiac cycle, given an estimation of myocardial deformation in any direction. And this process is highly automated and highly reproducible by available software for all the great manufacturers of echocardiographic machines. So, we can assess right ventricle longitudinal contraction by measuring right ventricle free wall longitudinal strain. Or we can evaluate global long to strain by including both the free wall and the intraventricular septum. On the other hand, um, it is also possible to assess the circumferential or oblique contraction by measuring right ventricle circumferential strain. And these all are um, assessment tools for 2D echocardiography. But to be honest, 3D assessment, either for the left or the right ventricle, is based on strain technology, at least using GE or Philips equipment and software. So using 3D echocardiography means using strain. But be aware, strain is not a magic bullet. Although it's often described as less load dependent, it is not independent of loading conditions. Moreover, it is affected by heart rate and dyssynchronity. So, you might say, interesting technology, nice pictures, but is it helpful? And I want to say yes, but the most studies come from transthoracic echocardiography. Right ventricular free wall strain seems to be better correlated to reduced right ventricular atrial fraction uh, assessed by cardiac MRI as compared to fraction area change in TAPSI. And 2D right ventricular global longer strain even outperformed 3D right ventricular atrial fraction in a study with, uh, with 60 heterogenic cardiac patients a couple of years ago. And there seems to be a close correlation between 2D right ventricular free wall strain and three-dimensional right ventricular atrial fraction assessed by transthoracic echocardiography, which has been shown in a big retrospective study from Hungary and Italy, including more than 700 patients. And it is about 10 years ago um, that Ternacle and colleagues from Toulouse in France showed that in the patients, when the refraction error chain was uh, lower than 35%, um, there was a um, uh, prolonged inotropic so support and an increase of mortality after surgery. And in their patients, even if the refraction error change was above 35%, um, but the global long term strain was uh, impaired, more impaired than 21 minus 21%, then the patients had the same risk for prolonged inotropic support and for postoperative mortality. And this observation 
is supported by a prospective study from Bordeaux showing right ventral strain to be a predictor of long-term mortality after cardiac surgery with a cutoff of about minus 17 percent. And um, and the, the outcome that is investigated and the strain measure has been used um, and the patient population depends on different cutoffs. Having a look on uh, LVAT implantation, and I will not go too much into details, um, the uh, prediction, the cutoff for global long term strain um, is much lower than uh, for a heterogenic cardiac surgery or cardiac population. But not only right ventricular long term strain predicts outcome in cardiac patients, this is also true for circumferential strain, as shown by a recent retrospective study from Budapest, including more than 350 patients. So, this was data for a transthoracic assessment in awake and spontaneous within patients. But what about intraoperative assessment um, by trans or echocardiography? And I have to say, there's far less data, but I would like to present you some of it. And this is a study from Toronto. It's uh, more, than, uh, more than 15 years uh, old. Um, and uh, the authors uh, were, uh, told us that uh, the strain analysis by T is also feasible in this setting. And the authors could show that the values for transthoracic echocardiography in awake and spontaneous within patients and for the assessment by transosophile echocardiography in ventilated and anesthetized patients were at least comparable. And we also performed a similar study uh, evaluating the entire peer of course of three-dimensional derived right ventricular free wall strain with my dear friend Jens Fassel from Dresden. Um, and we explored 30, uh, 40 uh, uh, on-pump cabbage patients without any inotropes, vasopressors, or pacing. And uh, we were not able to detect a uh, um, statistically significant difference uh, between transthoracic assessment uh, preoperatively and intraoperatively pre-bypass transosophical assessment uh, of uh, 3D right ventricular free wall strain using TomTech and Philips. Another interesting study from Taiwan, published a couple of years ago, uh, was able to show that right ventricular global long term strain uh, predicted uh, post-operative uh, atrial fibrillation in patients after cardiac surgery with a cutoff of about minus 16 to minus 17, depending on the time point of assessment. And the same group could show that pre-bypass uh, global long term strain of the right ventricle was a reliable tool to predict high inotope support after cardiac surgery, and again with a cutoff of about minus 17%. A group from Tübingen in Germany developed their own 3D right ventricular uh, strain analysis software because um, 3D strain uh, uh, software is only available for transthoracic evaluation. Um, and using this custom-made software, they could observe that right ventricular global long term strain and right ventricular circumferential strain um, in their study population were independent associated with patients' short-term outcome, including mortality, uh, mechanical circulatory support, and prolonged ventilation. And another study uh, we uh, performed together uh, with Jens Fassel um, we try to define normal values for right vertical free wall strain, um, and we uh, explored uh, 150 uh, patients prospectively, um, and uh, were able to define a lower limits of normality for right vertical free wall strain. This was in our patient population of about minus 13. By the way, a uh, lower limit of normality in this patient population um, uh, for 3D right ventilation friction was about 35%. But finally, let's have a look on the pathophysiolog pathophysiological meaning of strain analysis. What is described by right ventricular longitudinal strain? And this is a very nice recent study from Budapest, including 60 patients undergoing right ventricular pressure conducted scatterization for different reasons, as well as right ventricular strain and 3D echocardiography. 
And what the outputs could show is that right ventricular longitudinal strain reflected right ventricular arterial coupling, while the pressure strain relationship, and you heard about it uh, uh, from Dr. van der Heuvel, um, reflected contractility of the right ventricle in their patient population. In this case, it was an already commercial available software from GE Healthcare. So, I would like to summary my talk. I would like to say that the right ventricle structure and contracted pattern are complex. And common echo parameters only partly describe right ventricle function. Right ventricle strain is not a magic bullet. But strain offers additional information about right ventricle function, in particular right ventricular arterial coupling. And strain can predict outcome in cardiac surgery patients. Remember, 3D right ventricular AQ friction, which is considered as a reference method, is a strain-based measurement. Last but not least, right ventricular strain offers great opportunities for future developments. So I would like to leave you with a future perspective. Since artificial intelligence is evolving in all parts of science, this is also true for echocardiography. And the potential of these techniques is increasingly recognized. And strain analysis is best suitable for the automated evaluation of right ventricular function, which was shown by this automated evaluation of right ventricular AQ friction from 2D loops correlating well with cardiac MRI. And this technique all is already reaching trans uh, evaluation. Another point, most evaluation to date on right ventricular strain has been done for longitudinal strain. But we are increasingly recognizing that also circumferential strain is important. And new software solutions are for the assessment of the other strain qualities are upcoming. But till now, this is largely unexplored. A further interesting development in RV strain, and you heard it in the previous talk, is the assessment of pressure strain relation as a load independent measurement of right ventricular contactility. And this technique already showed to predict out outcome after Elvert implantation assessed by preoperative transthoracic echocardiography. And our group has only shown that this assessment um, it might already be feasible for trans uh, echocardiography, which we presented at the 18th World Congress in Singapore at the beginning of this year. So, to go back to my first slide, is strain the answer for quantifying right ventricular function? And I would like to say, it may not be the answer to all of our questions, but it can become an important tool for clinical decision making in the future in the period of course of right ventricular function assessment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lamus. That was uh, a great presentation, and thank you very much for uh, letting us know more about uh, the the role of strain in in the RV assessment. Because I think it's uh, it's new technology, and it's uh, every day like uh, more use in our regular ORs, and we really appreciate that. Thank you.